we're not just sitting here thinking, oh, money, we know we need money. You know, I told him, I told him, you know, people give. And he said, well, you know, my church, they, they, they went to build a new, it's a Catholic church, went to build a new building, they had a building fund, they had three offerings a week, and finally after they got the building, he says, you've got to give some more because you've got to pay for this building. I said, well, that's foolish. That's, that's not right. So we got agreement there. <laughs> so finally, I said to him, listen, Rick, Forget about money. Yeah, forget about it for a minute. I mean, we need it. That's why I'm here. I don't like my job. It's okay. You know, I'm here. And, and so I said to him, I said, listen, Rick, the other day you told me that you were going to take your chances and stand before God, and he would think you're a pretty decent person. I said, that's not going to work. I said, now you are a pretty decent person. You're not, you know, you're not overly bad, you know. And um, I said, but listen, what if I told you that you could be completely forgiven of anything you've ever done wrong, and that you could be completely reconciled and become a child of God who loves you with an everlasting love and wants to show you how much he cares about you and he wants to give you a new life. Are you interested? Yeah, I like that. That's my new word. <laughs> you meet a terrorist, he's about to chop your head off. Listen, I gotta talk to you for a second. Are you interested? <laughs> Are you interested? Can you take that home with you? And you know what he said? He says, Do I have to go to church to get this? I said, No. You can go in your bedroom, in your car. Go in the garage, dig a hole in the ground, climb in, I don't care. You can take that with you. I gave him a Bible years ago. It's been on the shelf the entire time. It's all in. I said, but are you interested? I mean, forget the money. Forget all the stuff. Are you interested in knowing God? He loves you so much. And he just looked at me and says, I can, I can take that home and think about it. Now, I talked to him for years. I witnessed for years. But you never know when it's going to hit. Mm -hmm. Now, he didn't receive it. He didn't fall on his knees and cry out to God. It's, yeah. But it was a seed planted of reconciliation right. in his soul. Now, what if I would have said to him, Rick, you know, how would you like your stocks to do better? <laughs> Come to Christ. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's superficial. you got to get past that. We have to be see past all that junk and realize that we have a message that can cut right through the person's superficiality. Mm -hmm. That's the message of reconciliation. That's what Paul lived for. Mm -hmm. You know, five times in three sentences he mentions that word over and over and over because he's trying to tell people he's a reconciling God. Come to him. He'll show you that. Mm -hmm. So it's by the work of substitution. Oh, this is what I said to him. I said, so listen, Rick, you had two things fighting your relationship with God. First of all, your sin kept you from him and keeps you from him. On the other hand, God had a problem. See, let me say this to you. We say we're reconciled to God, but you know God's also reconciled to us. It's true. It doesn't say that, but Scripture points all over to it. It screams at you. We had sin. The soul, the soul that sins will die. He will stand before God, and he will be judged for eternity on that sin. And the other part is that God had anger and wrath towards sin. He's a holy God. A just God has wrath towards sin. So I said, a sinner will die. But I said, but Jesus, Rick, on the cross, took our sin away. And laid it on Christ. And then God poured out all his anger on Christ. And because of that cross, now there's nothing between you and God. Nothing. It just takes a person to believe. It took me two seconds. I got on the ground. I cried. Now everyone's experience is different. Don't get me wrong. Some people over time come to this. Mine was instantaneous. 
Because there was nothing between me and God. He was just waiting for me to turn to him and believe. The anger of God has been taken care of on the cross. It says in Isaiah chapter 53 that God laid on him all our sins and that Yahweh crushed him. God executed him. It wasn't the Romans who executed Christ. It wasn't. It was God's the executioner. He's the one who did it. And he removed our sin and his anger. And he's saying, come back to me now. That's our message. That's our message. The most, I don't know what the word comprehensive means, but it makes sense. The most comprehensive verse that explains all of this cohesively is in verse 21. Out of the entire Bible, this is bringing it right to the heart. And this is our message. He made him, it's a short list, who was him, Jesus, right? He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He bore our sin in his body on a tree. To absorb all the wrath. No, this is one way of looking at it. I'll give you two ways, and then we'll finish. When Jesus is in the garden, he cried out, God, remove this cup from me. God, remove this cup from me. God, remove this cup from me. And he wasn't talking about the Roman cross. He was not. He wasn't saying, I don't want to be crucified. He was not afraid of the cross, because if that were true, in the first two centuries after Christ, they nailed, they put people on crosses, lit them on fire. And they went down singing hymns. So the captain of our salvation is not going to be cowering in the garden saying, don't put me on the Roman cross. He didn't care about the cross. What he cared about was God was going to de reject him. He was going to be all eternity past. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit must have had a great time. I don't know how that even works. But they were in fellowship, in union. He was going to lose that for three hours on the cross. Being beaten, bloody. And there had to be a bloody sacrifice. This is true. And there had to be a violent sacrifice. This is true. But the worst moment in that time when he was laid, laid, bleeding, hanging, is, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God slammed the door of heaven on his son. All his anger. He drank the cup that he said to pass by him. And when he drank the cup of God's anger, Turned it upside down and then a drop came out. It was all gone. That is reconciliation. That is being able to go to the worst person on earth, the one who's been beaten, broken, whatever it may be, and offer him this true salvation. And God will do miracles when we do this. Because we have to understand we are his mouthpiece. So reconciliation is by the will of God by the act of forgiveness, by bringing people to the obedience of faith, all wrapped up in the substitution. You know, you can never get up here and never speak it as God deserves it to be spoken. I will walk back and think, oh, I forgot to say this, I should have said that, I should have said that, but you know something, we'll never do that right. But the fact is, it is by the act of substitution. And it says here, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, and then the flip side, that we might become the righteousness of God. Not our own righteousness. I mean, Paul said in his, the height of immaturity, I'm the chief of sinners. And he said that only because he was righteous, but he knew it wasn't his righteousness. It was God's. He stands in his righteousness. And one more thing, and I'm done. To personalize this, when he was on the cross, God treated Jesus like he lived your life. So he could treat you like you lived Christ. That's it. God lived, treated Jesus as though he lived Karen's life. Oh boy. So that he could treat you like you lived Christ. To personalize it, that's true. So reconciliation is what Paul was all about.